learning more about us in the talks that we give and the field trips that we lead in the summertime, uh, you can find that at this web address, uh, caroutlogistics.com, and you can email us at uh, the similar web address at Gmail. And if you're interested in being on our email list, just send us an email uh, requesting that you're on, to be added to our email list, and we'll do that. <laughs> so uh, tonight I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Andy Kroll. She's an archaeologist with the U.S. Forest Service. And uh, she does a lot of great work here in the San Luis Valley. And tonight she's going to be updating us on some of the archaeological work that's going on with Rio Grande National Forest. Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> and uh, thanks for having, having me back. And I want to kind of start our multimedia presentation tonight with a short film. This is done by former students of mine, so I try to really give it a lot of play. And this will launch us into our research that's been happening in the middle Sawatch drainage, gosh, over the last eight or so years. So uh, please enjoy this film, and then I'll move into the rest of the presentation and see if I can. And there's no sound. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> <laughs> just way down. Am I going to blast you guys out if I? Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to do that. <laughs> Is it on? What brought them to this high mountain valley? Okay, take two. They stayed only briefly, camping in rocky coolies close to the creek. They hunted in the cool of the early morning and dried meat by the fire at night. The hunters returned to this valley for more than a thousand years, camping where their ancestors had camped, walking the trails their ancestors had blazed. About 2,500 years ago, a few families began living in the valley throughout the fall, arriving as the summer's heat began to fade. They built houses on the rocky slopes overlooking the old hunters' camps. Their brush-covered shelters protected them from wind and rain. They gathered plants on the floodplain and hunted in the nearby hills. Men and women butchered animals, tanned hides, and ground seeds. Children learned from their parents and grandparents all the skills they would need to survive in this rugged landscape. They learned the ceremonies and traditions that told them about their world and their place in it. With each visit, they rebuilt the homes their ancestors had put up. They walked the same dry slopes, searching for game. 
They gathered plants by the same meandering stream. They watched the same stars on crisp fall nights. Soon the days grew short, snow began to blanket the high hills, and the people knew that it was time to leave. Most families following the broad river southward into the desert where they camped on mesas and in cliff-ribbed canyons. The men and women each carried heavy packs filled with food and tools. Even their dogs carried a share of the false harvest. As they said their goodbyes, they all knew they would return next fall to this rugged valley with a summer's worth of stories to tell. Indian families continued their fall visits for centuries, but about 1,500 years ago, something changed. Instead of leaving as winter closed in, they determined to stay on the rocky hills overlooking the creek throughout the coldest months. Instead of brush shelters, they built stout lodges made of timber and stone and covered with elk and deer hides. Their homes faced the rising winter sun, harvesting its heat, and were nestled against volcanic outcrops and above the reach of the cold air that pooled in the valley below. <coughs> Throughout the long winter, they lived on fall stored harvest, kept safe in their snug homes. <coughs> when spring came to the valley, they packed their gear to leave. Some families traveled west over the divide, at the head of the valley, and into the high country. Others went east, toward the broad parks ringed by mountains. But many stayed near their winter homes in the rolling hills and sage-covered parks. What brought people back to this valley, year after year? It was an important travel corridor, linking the basins and plains to the east, with the mountains and plateaus to the west. Much later in the 1700s and 1800s, youth bands regularly traveled this route, stopping briefly to gather pine bark and hunt deer near the remains of the ancient brush shelters. Fur trappers followed the youth's trails to the valley in the 1820s. Traders on the old Spanish trail passed through on their way from Santa Fe to California in the 1830s. But this valley was more than a landmark on a well-traveled route. It also held everything that hunting and gathering people needed to prosper. Early explorers reported seeing elk antlers scattered throughout the valley, along with tracks left by migrating bison. The Utes called the creek that flows past the ancient houses Kuchumpa, the river of buffaloes. They called the narrow gorge where the families built their stone and timber lodges Kuchapope, the Buffalo Gate. The raw materials people needed to make the stone tools for hunting and tanning hides could be found throughout the nearby hills and mesas. Even during the coldest months, the valley was a refuge for animals and the people who hunted them. The sheltering hills at the head of the valley blocked the cold winter winds that scoured the broad basins to the east and held back the deep snow drifts that blanketed the mountains to the west. The native people who built the timber and stone lodges knew they could count on this rugged landscape to sustain them through the winter. In some years, the fall harvest filled their storage bins. In others, hunger stalked the camp. But through seasons of lean and seasons of plenty, this place remained dependable. The valley also contained something else, something intangible, but no less important food or shelter. It contained the people's history, the traces of their ancestors' lives, written in the remains of their camps, their homes, and the paths they walked. As each 
generation returned to this rugged mountain valley, sharing their experiences over the evening campfire, their triumphs, hardships, disappointments, and moments of joy. Over time, the landscape came to express that shared reservoir of experience and knowledge. It became part of how the people who lived here saw themselves. How many times did you hear rugged landscape? <laughs> um, my former students are, are Cody Perry and Ben Sahib, who've gone on to form a group called Rig to Flip, uh, which is a metaphor for how we need to prepare for times of change and, and adaptation. And you know, th those of you who are river people also, so you just don't flip and lose all your stuff in the <laughs> river. Um, so that's uh, kind of an introduction to uh, several of our, what we call research zones in the valley that we've been working on um, over the past eight or nine years, I'm going to share. And I also want to mention that my husband, um, John Eviskovich, has done the maths um, for this presentation and has done a lovely job. And here we go. So. These are kind of the um, three main areas I'm going to talk about tonight, and I'll try not to rush through it, but I, I always tend to go over, and there's a lot to share because, as many of you know, this valley is so, so rich, and, and it's really such an interesting edge of, you know, we're just <coughs> west of the plains, we're just north of the Puebloan um, landscape, or this big basin, and then, of course, there's also this... Um, suggested mountain tradition of alpine, an alpine uh, mountain tradition in Colorado as well. So you, we really are a, a cultural uh, fault line here in the San Luis Valley that lends itself to lots of different <coughs> layers. Some of them are pretty obvious, others are very ephemeral and, and it would take a lifetime um, to start <coughs> to understand. Um, but we'll start with Sawatch. Uh, Creek AD 650, which is what you just noticed. Um, as part of the State Historic Fund grant, we did the film as a part of our public outreach for schools, but we also did a poster. So I do have posters here for very special teacher types, or if you are someone who has a very deep and abiding passion and love for the Sawatch drainage, you may have one as well. <laughs> um, but they are kind of special, and I do want them to go to places where they can be really appreciated. It's an artist's rendition of these structures that we've been studying. We've known about them for a long time. Renault was a DU archaeologist who came down in the 40s. He kind of pillaged the valley a little bit, but he is, you know, he's one of our grandfathers. You have to revere him because he did, he was one of the first to say a lot about the valley, kind of put the valley on the map and did notice these stone structures, um, most of which are up in the Sawatch Valley. Uh, the Hushers, uh, uh, a team also came in, and they uh, th called them Hogans. They thought they were early Navajo. Uh, so they've had a lot of um, different names put to them, but really, uh, since 2009, we've been systematically studying these um, and what we've come to is, is kind of startling because you often think of hunter-gatherers like really they're in the winter in the San Luis Valley. You, you, you get the, the heck out, right? You go to Pueblo, I mean you might go to Taos, Pagosa Salida, anywhere but here. You don't go to Gunnison. <laughs> um, but what we're starting to see were these stone structure, and I'm, I mean villages, these are 15 to 20 stone structure habitations kind of set up on, on some benches above the creeks in what we think is this refugia up a Cochitopa Pass. And those of you who know Cochitopa Pass or have run cows up there, it stays pretty dry and pretty warm um, much of the year in our upper crossing site. I remember when I was heading up there to put some sensors, some temperature sensors that would gather daily temperature data. And I was like, what do I need this sensor for? I drove from 
Sawatch, uh, the town, and it was 9 degrees at 11 in the morning. And I get up to the upper crossing site, which is the furthest um, triangle there at the confluence there with the Old Spanish Trail. Guess how warm it was up there? Any guesses? And this was in a, a 10 minute drive, right? 41 degrees. Oh. And it was 9 in Sawatch. And I like threw my temperature sensor, like, oh, I, I got it. I, I figured it out. So this is uh, what's known as the Upper Crossing site. We have our wonderful Upper Crossing Guard Station, which you can rent. Uh, but please don't pillage the archaeology. And that's a lot of why we did this research. This uh, was about to be rented out. But no nothing had really been done. Colorado College had done a little bit here. But we really didn't have a comprehensive idea of um, what was in the area. So in the film, um, we talked about a few of these. So I um, hope I don't blind anybody with this. Um, back here, where we first did our excavations, where we were seeing a lot of stuff bleeding out, these are the earliest. These are the hunting camps and what we think is a late archaic basin house that dates to about 2,500 years ago. These folks were still moving around, doing kind of what you would traditionally think of as, as hunter-gatherer activity. Excuse me. But then later, they, s they bumped up here on this bench, and this is where you start to see these stone structure villages created, and then up here. There's like eight stone structures up here. There's one up here. What the heck? And I, I, you know, being someone who does field work in the summer here, like you don't want to be up here in July, living up here. <laughs> You're going to get struck by lightning. Well, that's what made us start to think, well, they weren't here in July. They were here in the winter and in the fall. So this was our first excavation down here behind the guard station to really get a sense of this. And uh, we've done many, many uh, projects with Paleocultural Research Group. They're a wonderful nonprofit, uh, member supported, uh, and we couldn't do the work we do without them. And you'll see some more opportunity to do some local work um, at the end of this presentation. This was a great project. This is me actually doing archaeology, like actually digging dirt. <laughs> this is like a one-time thing. Um, and we got, we got down onto a, a, a what we think is like at the bottom here. We never hit the bottom. But I got a nice little Mallory point that was about 4,000 years ago, uh, middle archaic site. And it's just filthy with midden and charcoal. And but um, no bison bones. I don't understand that. Um, it's called the Cochitopa Pass, the Buffalo Gate, where, where the bison bob. Um, so here are some of the uh, projectile points, a lot of stuff from the uh, middle to late archaic. And then you do have, um, of course, some Paleo-Indian sprinkled about. And that's this guy. He's an older, um, that's an older atlatl dart. And then we had uh, several of these. These are late archaic, still an atlatl dart, but you're starting to get the notching. But we have some evidence here where we think there was some intermingling of this, the dart and some arrow points. So this could very well be a transition site where they were maybe some people were still using the atlatl, but they were moving into the bow and arrow. It had to happen somewhere, right? Some pro pro probably held on to the atlatl as long as they could. Like, I used to hold on to my flip phone. I'm like, I don't need an iPhone. And this is that great shot. Um, archaeologists used to have to get up on a ladder with their 35 millimeter camera and hope that they get the shot. And then they get back in the lab and they get it um, developed and they missed it. But now you can do this on an iPhone with a GoPro and all this other amazing stuff. So pretty cool. And this is one of the best examples of this, the stone structures that were built with some, you know, high dollar timbers and, and they were, you know, kind of built to last about 1,500 to 1,300 years ago. We call uh, Sawatch Country the true value of the San Luis Valley because it's filthy with tool stone. Uh, this is a quartzite quarry by Trickle Mountain. There's also rhyolites and um, Cherts all over the place, chert cobbles. Up in the same area, we've been doing quite a bit of peeled tree research. Many of you know about the culturally modified trees. 
Uh, Marcy's here tonight. She's getting her PhD in culturally modified trees. And these are all over the landscape. Um, our f fire and fuels folks like SID help us protect these when we're doing prescribed burns. These are organic living cultural resources. And uh, we know that the Utes and the Apaches peeled this um, really high, nu highly nutritious cambium out for food, but probably also used it for cradle boards and um, saddle parts as well. And you can date these scars. Um, and so we have, with the permission of our, um, our colleagues, our, the Ute elders and the Hickory Apache elders, they just, um, Mr. Naranjo said, just don't core them all, Angie, just don't. And I'm like, okay, I, I, we won't core them all. Um, but the ones we have cored, we've gotten a very statistically valid sample up there at Upper Crossing and have found some very interesting clusters of dates. Um, a nice cluster in the 1820s, 1828 to 1829. And then another one, the reds, goes 1870 to 1871, which um, suggests uh, a winter camp there uh, because you can get seasonality by dating these scars using dendrochronology. And uh, Virginia Simmons in her, in her book, Land of the Six-Armed Cross, who has it, who loves it? In there, she talks about a big, anecdotally, we've known about a big winter camp that um, was right on the Nielsen um, Ranch there at the confluence of, the, of Sheep Creek and um, Sawatch Creek. So this data really corroborates that, which is super exciting. And then this is just a fun one of uh, those of us who study the Old Spanish Trail, Susie Off and others, um, who are part of the La Vereda chapter here in the valley, um, know that Gunnison followed the Old Spanish Trail, and Heap, uh, who is along for the ride, did this illustration there at what we think of and as the Buffalo Gate, the Cochitopa, uh, and it really is a, g a gap there on your way up to North Pass. And then our colleague John Horn was able to retake that photograph in that very same pot spot. So now bouncing uh, over to the east side of the valley to uh, the Toa of the Sangres, we have this other research zone we call the Baca Mountain Track. We um, acquired this land in 2009, I think, Andrew, during the big Baca land exchange. 2004. Well, the Forest Service, we didn't get our land until later. We got the last but the best piece. <laughs> and that's just a rendition of uh, the old Baca land grant. Um, and and um, Virginia will say there are no Spanish land grants in the San Luis Valley, and she's right. Um, this was a Mexican land grant, but it never really was proved up. And it was uh, more of a, a land pawn for later land schemers when it became the United States. Um, but when I first came to the valley to work as the archaeologist on the Rio Grande, um, it was Steve Bunker, uh, Bob's son, who called me and said, you know, I hope you know what we have out here. There, Steve. Hi, Steve. And he said, you know, there's stuff all over. And so um, we started to explore this land. And actually, Steve, I was out with you this day. This is the first thing I found, which was a monomatate set. You never find them together, nor do you find both of them with red ochre on them. And that's how awesome the sand is out there. It's, it's an archaeologist's best friend and worst nightmare. The, the preservation is amazing, but it's all churned up and you never, you don't know what's up and what's down. Um, so with some old Spanish trail money, National Historic Trails money, we leveraged out a larger State Historic Fund grant and we did a large scale survey of the Baca Mountain Tract, the two, uh, almost 900 acres of survey, found really interesting sites. This one kills me because I probably walk by trees like this all the time. It's a shelter. This old pinon fell down. There's monos in here. There's a late prehistoric projectile point. This was someone's shelter. There's a little um, space you could get out of the wind, and this was probably a lean-to. That's the kind of preservation we see. We even see a lot of the um, wood still on the ground. Um, lots of big roasting features out here. Not sure exactly why so big and what they were roasting, probably meat, deer. They get those rocks really crazy hot and probably put an animal down there and cover it. Um, and so a, a lot of this is really 
highly fractured, fire-cracked rock, we call it FCR. Um, this is our good friend Robert Wunderlich um, standing in another type of stone habitation site. These we're just beginning to get to know on the east side of the valley, made out of those, what my dad likes to call baby heads, those glacial rocks coming out of the, the sangres, but they uh, put a, a auger down in the middle of that and it was just black, so this is an old habitation site as well. Here's our friend Bob Bunker at what we call the bunker site um, that uh, the bunkers also alerted us to. Um, it's really important to get to know your locals if you're an archaeologist. Um, sometimes we go to fisticuffs about collecting on federal land, but um, by and large, we learn a lot from each other. They know the country. And Bob certainly has shared his knowledge, and this site has really turned out to be what we think is the best Spanish, old Spanish trail type site in the nation. And you just don't have these come along. And just a little uh, background on the old Spanish trail. Um, it was uh, pioneered by Antonio Armijo in 1829. He pioneered the kind of the southern route from Abiquiu out to California. This area, um, we're on the east fork of the north branch of the old Spanish trail that went kind of from Abiquiu Taos up over Cochitope and out to California. And the traders were carrying woolens to trade for piles of horses to bring back. Uh, probably removing slaves along that trail as well. So we're missing a lot of, uh, we don't have the diaries from the old Spanish trail like we do from say the Gunnison expedition. But we've done a ton of work on this site. You can see 2009 to 2016 and the general area doing test testing, some dendro, 19 acres now of metal detecting. We've gone over it twice and the second time with a super high dollar metal detector and found just as much, which scares you as an archeologist. <laughs> and did um, some site mapping. I'm gonna, I've given a lot of presentations on the old Spanish trail, so I'll kind of go through this a little quickly, but just to kind of give you a summation of our uh, many years of work out here. Uh, something we noticed, and it was because of Bob again, when we were standing out on the site, he said, do you notice all these trees have been cut? And these are old, old pinon. Um, we've dated some of them are as old as 400 years ago, and our, uh, our tree guy, Peter Brown, says that these, all these old pinons and juniper on that side of the valley are the babies from the great drought of the late 1500s. So these are, that's how long this fire interval has been. This hasn't, we haven't had a stand replacing fire. Though we do have some interesting um, thoughts about this site because it's probably burned all around it and had stand replacing burns around it. But because the traders took all the ladder fuels off of these trees, it saved the site. I think, it's kind of cool. <laughs> so we've dated many of these limbs We've dated these big blazes. We've gotten these really interesting dates. We need more, but the initially it suggests kind of some early occupation there of the 1760s and 80s. The middle is the smoking gun of when the Old Spanish Trail was alive. And it stopped in 1848 with the Treaty of Guadu Guadalupe Hidalgo. And different routes and travel and freight um, changed. And so the Old Spanish Trail lost its relevance though it was still used as a trail for other reasons. Wagon roads, Gunnison came. Um, and then late, 1850s to 1860s, and this is really interesting because we have military buttons, some Spencer cartridges. We think it was Gunnison's expedition who also camped here. And in his diary, he said they camped on Chatagnon Creek, which is now known as Dead Man. So here's the tally um, these days. There's 25 musket balls, spent and unspent, we found. 27 metal points. You wait your whole life as an archeologist to find one of these. 30 tinklers, which are on your, um, you know the jingles on a jingle dress? And on buckskins. 17 metal butcher knives, bolsas. These were kind of a, a type of currency, especially in the Taos area. They were, these were traded for like so many bolsas for a Comanche buffalo robe, right? So these were probably made back east. And then this is a 
metal uh, or a brass barrier from a kettle that was cut. So they probably melted that brass down when this wasn't working anymore, as it wasn't going to work anymore as a, a kettle, a pot. And we see a lot of little pieces and parts of metal there, and we think they were retooling and making their own metal artifacts. But why are there so many butt musket balls and points laying around? Metal is a very high commodity during this era, and we think something might have gone down. There might have been a type of skirmish because you just didn't leave that much metal around, including the, a brass butt plate of a Springfield model 1795 Type 3 musket or this little piece of a micolette, which was a long-used uh, musket that was the kind of the type, kind of the, I don't know, the M16 of the musket world. This was used since the 17, 1625 in Spain, so it, it was very long-lasting and probably easy to use and clean. So lots has gone on with the, the old Spanish trail and, and the bunker site, and stay tuned for more because um, on the last round, when the metal detectors were flying around the site, well, we f found a lot of metal in the trees, so I'd get calls on my cell phone saying they wanted to cut these trees down to see what was in there, and I said no. And then um, they found several uh, hearths with metal in them, so we actually have features now that we're going, and we're going to bring a ground penetrating radar out this summer, and we're going to look for more features. So it's just the site that keeps on giving. So other um, pretty amazing features in the Sangre de Cristos are these arrastras, which myself included have thought, well, now that we have found the Spanish evidence of Spanish mining. Well, we, we did look into this. We, we recorded several. They all date to the 1880s when it was mainly Euro-American miners coming and uh, looking for gold in the Sangre. So it turns out this is just a wonderful technology that's been co-opted through the ages, right? It came from Spain, came from Persia to Spain, Spain to Mexico, Mexico to here, and then the Euro-American miners used it because easily um, two people and a mule or a burro could, could mill the ore this way instead of having to uh, build a big stamp mill to, do, to mill your ore. And this is a great one up on Pole Creek. They're fantastic, but I will say there are cabins associated with this that have corner fireplaces. Looks just like a fogon, you know, in northern New Mexico, which I've never seen in any other kind of miner's cabin, so stay tuned. Uh, below Pole Creek, we have the Duncan campsite, pretty well known and actually probably the most intact uh, gold mining camp in Colorado because it's been protected for so long. It's hard to get there. You can't just drive there. People have been very respectful of this place. Hasn't been dug. So we've been able to do some very, very good research there. And we've also restored John Duncan's cabin. He founded Duncan Town Site in uh, the early 1870s. And he found gold, but then he said, you know what, I'm going to start a town and I'm going to sell town lots instead. <laughs> so he made his uh, his money, and most people made their money on, on miners who wanted to find gold. And as many of you know, uh, they were all coming to this land, which was the Baca Ranch, and it wasn't their land. And they were finally went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, yes, you are squatters, you must leave. This is a very short story to a very long and arduous uh, move where uh, the Duncanites had to move down to Liberty, had to pick up their houses and move. Some people didn't want to move, and the U.S. Marshals had to come in and, and burn them. So uh, they left a lot behind, I will tell you that, and some really interesting reusing, recycling of cans. We have found the cobbler's fe feature because there's a ton of shoes there. So we have so much more to do here, and I would love um, actually to partner more with Adam State to, to come out and do some more historic archaeology here. And um, uh, a Mr. Clark, or s is it Stuart, Andrew, do you remember? Clark. Clark uh, showed up at the dunes and said, my grandfather was born at Duncan Camp. And Fred asked, well, do you have any pictures? And he said, well, yes, I do. And so and we now have these amazing pictures of the camp, which is 
you know, has dogs and kids. We have find a lot of toys at the camp, which I always love. And if you notice this stone here and this awesome root cellar, here's this stone. We were able to take that picture and find it, and these are descendants of the, of the Stuarts who were able to come out. Okay, now just get, get your altitude, take a deep breath, drink some water. We're going to go way up high now. I'm going to do that real quick. And to this amazing country above Creed, um, known as Snow Mesa. And uh, I used to work up near Steamboat. Has anybody ever been to the Flat Tops? Yeah, it's just like the Flat Tops. Um, just big, open, you're the tallest thing around when the lightning comes. Um, no trees. So big, old f lava flows, um, as I understand it. And so for many years, we've known about some big sites up there, originally found by a Colorado College student, Catherine Maus, in the 90s, that have intrigued us, but we never have projects up here. We're always relegated to the timber sale and the grazing allotment and the recreational trail. But when we get a chance to go up high, like we did for these sheep allotments, proposed sheep allotments up in this country, we get really excited. Of course, there's so much vegetation, you just you can't see stuff until you're lucky to come across a cut um, like this, um, which we did. And um, we started to find some really really old projectile points all around this area. Many dating to the Middle Archaic, so about 6,000, 5,000 years ago. And I'm missing a slide. Maybe I'll see it here soon. So um, we decided, to, and we were lucky enough to, to have a little funding, leverage a little funding, with, uh, once again with Paleocultural, to uh, pack in to this country. And it's way in there. Um, this is not far, this in fact, this is off of the Bristol Head Road, um, but you can also come in off of Spring Creek Pass, and you can kind of see Snow Mesa is the same kind of big lobe as Bristol Head. It's the same kind of formation up there. So, you know, you're excited. We're, you know, we're going to pack in. This is, this is, you know, pretty exciting. We're with a bunch of college students that show up in little cotton jeans. <laughs> And tennis shoes and like the wrong pack and everybody's gone and I'm there with the college students like oh my gosh <laughs> it's late August yeah and it's it's got, it was cold um, so a group of us went all the way up top um, this was my crew up this is on the Continental Divide and right along the old uh, the old Spanish Trail <laughs> the, the Colorado Trail and the Continental Divide, and you can just see what kind of landscape it is up here. It's, you know, who knows, 6,000 years ago, you know, it was warmer and drier. It was called the Alta Thermal Refugium when the tree line was higher. So this very well could have been more treed. They would have they had to have fuel, but this is a huge site. This is a huge site. Just filthy with every kind of tool stone, uh, artifacts mainly t dating to the Middle Archaic, and you just never see this at this altitude. You generally see where a couple hunters, three guys went through hunting, maybe sharpened and made a tool, and left a few flakes and went on. But this was a year after year after year um, episodic camping, and it's huge. So we think, um, and we want to do more research, we think this was a gathering place. We think that the grandmas and the kids the, the women, everybody came up here from the down below and met other groups. This is quite the crossroads between big basins, Gunnison over to Silverton over here, the San Luis Valley. So we think, and, and we would sit here and people would be hiking by on the Colorado Trail and you'd see a person, you know, like Monty Python when he's running forever. And, and they're still not coming, but you're, I've seen that guy walking for an hour. You can see people, and you could probably see somebody smoke. So I think they wanted to be seen. They wanted, think about being a small band of hunter-gatherers. You needed to spread your gene pool. You needed to bring more genes in. 
um, you know, a whole host of reasons you'd want to meet up with other people. This probably changed later when you didn't want to run into him anymore because there's way more of you than you like. Um, but we find this to be a really interesting site. Here's the slide I was looking for. This is the Hanging Valley site. This is um, the cut I'd showed you earlier that had several hearths uh, coming out. And um, this surprisingly dated to far later, only 1700 um, years before present BP. Uh, this is known as also the Gloves on Feet site. Uh, Kath, can it, Kathy, this was your site and Marcy's. And it was so cold and wet, everybody's boots were just sopping wet that they were taking their boots off and putting their gloves on their feet. And they were cozy for maybe a little while. It, we did get some pretty intense weather um, and some hypothermia, edge of hypothermia ensued, but all for science, so it was super worth it. Um, at this site, we did have some very interesting iron oxide, also known as red ochre, found um, within the archeological context. This was highly coveted by people. This doesn't appear to be naturally occurring geology. This was part of the archeology span there. And of course, it was used for paint and, and ceremony. But the other thing they were going for up here, and I also think they were going for bighorn sheep in this country, and there were a whole bunch of those big juicy crickets up here in August that I bet they just loved and dried and probably ground up. But this chert, um, there's a big source of this chert that comes out, out of um, this, what's basically that same Wheeler um, uh, formation up there. Okay, the piece de resistance. This is a very recent find. We need your help to understand what's going on with this. Um, we're calling this the Dead Man's Cave Gulch Discovery 2017. And uh, my colleague Jason Remshart, he's our fisheries biologist, and uh, Sally Weir, who could not be here tonight, our volunteer coordinator with uh, Outdoors Volunteers Outdoor Colorado. We're just hiking around, and they found this. Uh, interesting laid rocks um, in a rock shelter. Um, and right below some climbing routes, which uh, has some bearing on why we decided to do what we did. And this is kind of where we have all of our gear um, set up um, to do a recovery. And um, it started to appear to be uh, a box, a very large box, very deep, handmade wooden box. Uh, but then we realized there were two boxes. Uh, built, filled with items, and carried a long way and buried here. Okay, I just want you to hold that on, hold that in your minds. No gold. No, gold. <laughs> no of course, we're all waiting for the gold to blooms. <laughs> Oh, are you kidding? We're dying. We're like, hurry up, what's in there? And uh, so this is just a very uh, excruciating detail of, of how we started to pull this apart um, and see what we were really looking at. And here's you know, when we first kind of took one of the, no, that I will say that Jason had taken one of the boards off. And ha of course, I would have done it too. I would have had to have looked to see what's in here. But you start to see some cans and some um, really interesting fabric or rug. What did we think this was, John? No idea what that is. Um, so we, what, what, what's that? What was that thing A hammer for driving, driving spikes. Interesting thought. Are, do you have your notebook? Which this, this here? It's wooden, right, John? It's wooden. It's wooden. Yeah, it wouldn't have been a right. Uh, it wouldn't have been a mallet. So um, we did like good archaeologists, and we had to be very safe. We were a little worried about pack rat and hantavirus, so we all kind of um, wore masks. But we excavated. John excavated. I say we all the time, don't I? John excavated the. 
the fill around and we screened it and we tagged um, and bagged the artifacts. And so you could start to see it's really starting to reveal itself. Look how deep that is. What it, and it's, so that's two boards um, in depth. And then we started to move into the, the second box. Now the first box was pretty intact. It was really dry. It was like a, dry, in a dr great dry cave situation. But the second box was right under the drip line. So it was just mush. It was organic. So not much, a couple of uh, buttons, uh, grommets in there. And then this really interesting can that we're, I've never seen a can quite like this one. So we carried it out kind of Ark of the Covenant style. <laughs> this was, you know, a bunch of guys. Yeah, I love getting a bunch of guys together to figure, figure it out, how to get it out of there without, but I mean, think about getting it out, um, so just someone getting it in, and why? So it starts to reveal itself, and we start to see a whole bunch of pieces of clothing but mostly women's journals, ladies' journal, ladies' women's world, ladies' home journal, the London magazine. But you see the date, 1918. These, some of these are in fantastic shape. And we have a name, Earl Matson from Monta Vista. We Googled him, it's crazy what you can do. But he was an assistant pharmacist in Monta Vista, I think. So we're excited to kind of try, anybody know any Matsons? No? M-A-T-Z-E-N. And then a lovely uh, Victorian, uh, this is what we think it is, a boot top. Uh, you know, all the tiny little buttons to cover your legs because you don't want to show those legs at all. Uh, it's corduroy. And then a bunch of Prince Albert um, metal cans full of labels. And now we have not gone through these because we have a Colorado College student. This is going to be her capstone project. Um, Ella Axelrod is going to look over the whole um, assemblage and research it and clean it and, and help us to accession it. And we hope uh, that she'll come down and um, give, some pr give a presentation maybe right here next time. And um, we're hoping also maybe an exhibit at the Rio Grande County Museum. But I think Louise there at the museum is going to be a great help and maybe t helping track down some descendants because, you know, does anybody, okay, what are some theories? Why, why would someone do this? We love to. Crushed up and jammed down those cans. Just kindling. Just kindling. They had to use a match, and they had to get a fire going. We had a match back in those days because if you run out of matches, it would smoke the steel. And then you had to get an old bird pen or something. <laughs> well, that, are you writing this down, John? Because oh, oh, it's just, no, I'm, I'm looking behind you. Because we need ideas. I mean, it's, yes, Kat. Oh, Oh, it's a memorial. Now there's men's clothing in there too, but that is an incredible, 1918 was the time of the, the big flu. Interesting, that's a good one. Any others? But you see this little, look at the cute little Priscilla. But just, an, and you know, I think perhaps it, it had been pilfered before. There might have been some things of greater value that we're not seeing. Someone may have found it. I'm glad we did get it out. I think we're going to learn a lot. Um, John and I, when we were um, screening the very last bits, found a beautiful women's turtle shell pin, mm -hmm. a hair pin, and a silver spoon at the bottom. But then some stuff is just like labels in Prince Albert cans, you know, which just doesn't make too much sense. 
Um, so here's my plug at the end for any of you who might be interested in joining us in some of these adventures. So we've just learned um, that uh, the State Historic Fund is going to be funding a multidisciplinary project right here in our very own Lahara Canyon um, at a very um, important and sacred place to many um, known as La Botica, the pharmacy. And it's also a, a huge archaeological site. So we think this is a place that people have come for a long time probably to collect plants, but also it's a refuge. It's a very hidden, hidden place. I personally think the Espinoza brothers also hid out here. Um, so this is happening um, the week of June 3rd. You can go on to paleocultural.org. I, I don't think he's quite got it posted yet, Dr. Mark Mitchell, but that's going to be on there soon if you want to sign up for that one. Um, and one of the reasons I think this area is um, a very special plant gathering place, La Botica means the pharmacy, is you have this massive um, talus slope here. The Magote, Magotes are up here. Lahara Canyon is down here. And you have all these little seeps and little microclimates at the base of this talus slope. Ice, you know how ice caves, little ice caves? And you have things like nettle and raspberry all growing at the mouths of those. So conceivably, this was a one-stop shop for plants that might you might need to go higher elevation to get, but they're here all together, and rice grass. And, and interestingly, when um, archaeologists first recorded this, you know, we'd known anecdotally for years this was a, a, a plant gathering place, mostly by the Hispanic communities. Um, they're like, oh, there's nothing left there. It was, it was all overgrazed. It's whatever was there is gone. Well, we don't think that's true. So, um, and I, we're going to get into some of these features, these roasting features in here, and maybe see what they were processing and, and get some floats out of that and see what kind of um, flora we can, we can see what was happening there. Now, if you're more of a nail pounding, bricks and mortar type of person, um, you can sign up for our Historicor project that's going to be happening at the end of August in Sawatch. Um, to help us restore the vigas at our CCC era uh, Sawatch Ranger Station. And as an added bonus, you, we will put you up at the Upper Crossing Guard Station that you saw earlier, and I will come up and give you a tour of those awesome stone structure sites. So that'll be a little added bonus for um, this project. So we welcome any and all who would like to join us. So that's all I have. Thank you. So any questions? Okay. <laughs> no, no questions tonight? There's one. Every time I have them, I think I'm going to the big the big site on the top of Snow Mesa. <coughs> so that was found by a geology student from Colorado College in the early nineties. Really? She was doing a geology survey and just happened to see all that chert laying around. And she knew, she said, there has to be a source of this tool stone. She knew enough about archaeology <coughs> to know that this was a unique um, tool stone source, which would draw people for miles. But the interesting thing about that site is you had obsidian. You had chert from you know, a long way away, quartzites from far away. So we think they were there probably for other reasons as well. But spot. It was. We think it was a trading spot, a meeting spot. Is church money showing up in any of these spots? Yeah. You know, I'm dying to find it on a site in the valley, yeah, and I have yet to. Um, and we have turquoise mines. We have the King Mine in Manassas. We have another one um, up outside of Villa Grove. But um, my guess is, is that. The nomads that were here, the semi-sedentary folks, just didn't use it. But I think the Puebloans were coming up the, um, the valley because at the King Mine, there is this old 1935 site form that describes um, finding some hammer stones and there's a, a, a skull, some human remains, and there was sign of prehistoric mining of that turquoise. And they would burn the vein. They'd start a really uh, hot fire 
and then use antlers or hammer, you know, hard quartz hammer stones to get at the turquoise, but you just don't see it. And I've gone and I have uh, comparative pieces from both of those mines, and we never see it on sites, but it doesn't mean it's not there and it isn't in a raw form. We might have missed it too, you know. So. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming out tonight. Really appreciate it. Sure was nice. Thank you.